Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, do this in such a way that I project my voice this morning, and uh, you're aware that uh, my voice uh, does not carry Will real well, so I am going to be pushing it out. And uh, if it seems like I'm yelling, that's hardly ever anything I do in a message anyway. So, okay, so I'm going to be pushing. And if you're not getting it, I'm going to look at deacons around here then uh, some others, you know, just kind of do this. So that may well go down and I need to bring it up. So you help me out. You remind me this morning. Kind of reminds me what's going on here, uh, Matt Redman. And a lot of songs that we sing, uh, he has worked on and produced. One day, uh, his pastor thought that they were depending too much on the electronics, so he cut it out. And they went for a period of time in which uh, they had no electronics in their worship. We got battery lights here and battery power. They have none. And that's when he came up with the song, It's All About You. Jesus, it's all about you. So, gives us an opportunity this morning. Um, I don't think we have to let the young people be dismissed because they're already gone, aren't they? <laughs> this that I have in my hand is the recording device that, uh, it's my phone, but Nate's asked me to use this, so we're going to see what comes up here. You know, there's a phrase that's used over and over, oops, in the Bible, and it's a phrase that um, is repeated so very frequently, 12 times as a matter of fact, that I've put them up here on the image. Doc's going to be controlling that one from what I understand, right? So hopefully, can you, can you see one of these? If not, come closer, and uh, we will, uh, not, not, ready to, not ready to go. Okay, so um, I put up here that verses that record these, and the statement that is used there is to the church. And it's recorded to the Corinthians a couple of times, Galatians, Thessalonians, the book of Revelation, it's repeated over and over and over, to the church to the church, and uh, this morning, we're going to pick up on that phrase, to the church. They communicate a message in all of those, to the church. And this morning, we're going to communicate a message for the heart of Heartland. Uh, between the time I left the house and the time I ride here, evidently the electricity went off, because it was on when I was there, and it's off when I got here. So somewhere in that process, it went off, and it's off all over town, by the way. Um, it's off at our house. It's off downtown, from what I've heard. So it's off. And we're going to do this with the electricity off. Um, we're going to talk to the heart of Heartland. Um, this morning, what we're going to talk about is vision. Vision, strategy, we're going to talk about purpose, direction for Heartland. As a matter of fact, this is where in our Walk by Faith series, we've been talking on the church, and this is the culmination of that part on the church. And next week, we conclude the entire series by, by faith. <laughs> Walk by faith. So, it's an important message for us to look at, for us to be talking about. Let me advance this, and let's start here. Did you advance that? We all have projects, okay? We have projects going on around that. Anybody here have a project? Let's see, where's the Govindas? You got a project? Pretty big project. Yeah, yeah, there's projects back there. I think hands going on. There's a project that's been going on. Well, as a matter of fact, every one of the members of our house has a project going on. I'm going to put one up here. If you can see that one. Can't see it very well. Those are shoes. And those shoes were originally just white tennis shoes. And then Ellie started on a project. And I got the project here with me this morning. I asked her permission to do this, so I do have permission. Uh, you can't see those very well, 
But these tennis shoes, she spent hours on coloring by hand. And these tennis shoes have a little police station that travels around the world depicted on them, okay? And uh, they have two different ties on them for the two doctor, doctor, doctor who? Hey, doctor who? And she spent, as a matter of fact, she got a crooked neck from working on these projects for such a long time. And she just finished up this weekend because they're waterproof now. So there you go. Project. Kaylee's got a project going on. It has to do with that right there. It's uh, the GRE. <coughs> she graduates this year, and she's been studying all week and weekend because next weekend she takes that. And Ellie's project was a whole bunch more fun than Kaylee's project going on. Alita has a project. Can you see that? <laughs> that's a project. That's not the first project she's had like that. That's Arabella, obviously, and uh, her project. I had a project. I'm going to put this up here. That project is a wall that for 12 years, since we put in our secular, our stair, not secular, circular staircase, um, has been, had drywall filled in with no finish on it, just bare drywall and a painted wall, and I, we covered it up for a while with boxes and, you know, laid stuff in front of it, and then I decided we need to finish this project. We have a project. We all have got projects. Go around the room. What projects you got going on? Okay. Back there. Packing. Uh-huh. A deck for my buddy for his campus. All right. Projects over here. You're working in your garage, yep, right? Okay. New flooring in the bathroom. There you go. Projects, uh-huh. Going to the doctor every week. That's a project. <laughs> That's a big project. That's right. Doc has a project of being a doctor every week. Well, maintenance transition, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and transition. That's right. There's a transition going. We all have projects. The Lord of the church gave his church a project right at the end of his earthly work, he gave him a project. I want you to turn there. Hopefully you can see it in your Bible. In Matthew 28, if you're not, if you can't see it, we'll project it here for you. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 is a interesting project because or the project that he presents here is pretty interesting. In Matthew 28, we have a Sunday morning, first day of the week, after Christ's cross. And on that first day of the week, towards the dawn, verse 1 tells us that day, there were two women that were going out to where Christ had been buried. And when they were going out, they were met by angels. And the angels met them and said, don't be afraid. I know what you're looking for. The soldiers were very afraid. He told them not to be afraid. I know what you're looking for. Christ is not here. This Jesus has risen. Go tell the disciples and that he'll meet them in Galilee. And as they were leaving the angels, because the angels said, go do that, and they go do that. And as they were going to do that, Jesus appeared to them himself. And basically, he says the same thing to them. He says, uh, then Jesus said to them, uh, do not be afraid. Uh, go tell my brethren. And I can't read it here because of the light. So uh, I'm going to meet them in Galilee. So go there. And, you know, it's very interesting to me that the Lord chose women to start this out. Isn't that interesting? You say, well, what's your point? I don't know what the point is. He just chose women. Oh, she's got a point. She's got a point. I imagine a few others that have a point. I don't know what the point is. I thought there may be a point made from that, but he did. And that's it. Okay? And uh, so they did. And you know, it's interesting because the whole context of this situation, which he takes up again a little bit later in uh, about verse 11 of 
chapter 23. It says this, and while they were going, this whole thing of the soldiers being afraid, they went to the chief priests, and as they went to the chief priests, they told them what happened, and they came up with this lie to confuse this issue, to kind of circulate this around so this would be played down. What? The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the meaning of that resurrection for people from the day of its inception has been lied about and played down so that the meaning of it does not get clearly communicated. That's the situation. And it was there in verse 16. By the way, Jesus set up this situation. All of it. He built, if you would, to the anticipation of the announcement of his project. I hope you would, because that's what he did. His whole life, he's been working on this project himself, and now he's about to announce this project to his followers. And this is what he says. He says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the uh, place where Jesus had told them to meet. And when they were there and they saw him, some worshipped, but some doubted. Some looked at this and they go, I I don't know. I I don't know if I really want to go along with this. That didn't detour Jesus from his announcement for the project or the plan for his project. Some bowed to it like right away and some, I don't know. That didn't deter him from his project, the announcing of his project, and the plan of his project. And here he announces it. He says, verse number 17, looks like, maybe 18, Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So, there you have the project. That's the project. That's it. Okay? So, uh, what did we do with the project? He laid it out. Great. There's a project. You know, it's kind of like somebody saying, make food. He said in this project, Make disciples. It's kind of like somebody saying, make food. And you know, there are some questions like, what food? I mean, are you in kitchen with electricity to make food? And is there a refrigerator and a stove? Where? I mean, we we have to know a little bit of the context here. Where, where are we at, this make food? Are we at a campsite? And is there an ice chest and an open campfire? Or are we out at the lake? And do we get the food out of the lake and use a grill? What are we doing to make food? He said, make disciples. That's what he said. And it In order to get this, we have to understand. As a matter of fact, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about understanding what he meant when he said a disciple. Make a disciple. And and, and two, this morning, we're going to see clearly what his purpose was for them in this. Because this is the project that he gave. This is the project. And then finally, we're going to talk about engaging in the process. And I'm going to end that one right there because that one's kind of, that one's kind of important. So these three things, understanding what a disciple is. Number two, <laughs> seeing clearly his purpose 
in this. And number three, engaging in the process. And this morning, we're going to cast a vision. We're going to talk about strategy. We're going to talk about what this is. Now, understanding right off what a disciple is, that we're to make disciples. When we talk about Heartland and uh, Heartland having a strategy, there are a couple of things. First of all, we already have some articles that talk about Heartland. As a matter of fact, those are available to you. If you don't have a copy, let me know. We'll get you a copy. Uh, we distributed them about two weeks ago so that everybody would have this. On the first page of that article there, here's a copy right here. On the very first page, it talks about why the church exists. And when we're talking about church, of course, we mean the building with the bricks and the mortar and the roof, right? What, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, we got, we got this one that we used during Sunday, and we got the one downtown on Water Street that we use frequently during the week. And that, yeah, which, no. The church is the people, obviously. But I say that over and over because we tend to forget that. We tend to lose that when we talk about the church existing as if it's some institution over there that uh, is functioning as a business or as an operation. Or, no, it's the people. Why this thing called the called out people of Jesus Christ exists here now. You know, he doesn't have to leave us here. You got that? The, we're, we're only here by his design and intent. And why is it that we're here? Heartland's response on that very first point here. The church exists, and we're not talking only about Heartland, but the church. Every one of us who are believers all across the world, and indeed here particularly us, we exist to glorify God through fulfilling the Great Commission, which is what this project is commonly known as, right? It's so recognized that it's called the Great Project, the Great Commission. We're to fulfill this in the spirit of the Great Commandment, which is to love the Lord your God, Yep, yep, everything you got, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep, that's it. We're to fill the Great Commission in the spirit of the Great Commandment. The commission is fulfilled as disciples of Jesus Christ are made and grow in their relationship with Him. God is glorified as we manifest His presence, as we do this, His work. That is the statement that's very first point concerning the church and concerning Heartland in particular as to why we are here, why we exist. John MacArthur in his book on this says this is the most important point that's made in Matthew. He says if you miss this point, you miss the point of the whole book. He goes on to say you miss the, whole, the point of the whole New Testament and where it's going. Because this project is central. It is the reason he left us here to make disciples. What does he mean by a disciple? As per Jesus, we have some input. There are several passages that I put up here, and I know you can't see them well. This will be put online. The, the passages are Matthew 26 and Mark 14, 4, and then three of them in John, John 8, 31, John 13, 35, John 15, 8. In all these passages, Jesus talks about people who are my disciples. In other words, he identifies some people who are my disciples. These are mine. So what he meant by making disciples is what he was doing and had been doing for years with these people. 
His disciples, these are mine. As a matter of fact, others knew it because those who were opposed to him, kind of like the Democrats versus the Republicans, it was kind of like Jesus versus the religious leaders of that day, and you're going to think, what's Democrat versus Republican? I'm not making that point, okay? You may make that point. I'm not making that point. The point that I was making is that there's opposition going on between them. An opposition of such a nature that there was lies that were circulating in order to dis and put down the reality of what was going on here. A reality that supersedes man and his politics to God and his work. And even those people who were appointed or opposed to him pointed at him and said, your disciples... They recognized that what he was doing for years was disciples, and when he said his project, he said, make disciples, indicating like what I have been doing, and that others have recognized very, very clearly. Now, I'm going to move on here, because there are characteristics. As a matter of fact, these characteristics... Our, uh, our leaders got together in preparation for what we're doing this morning without lights. Our deacons and our elders, we got together and I gave them a question to lead into what we were going to be talking about. And the question is, what does a disciple look like? What is a disciple? What do they look like? So we took that question and uh, I've got their answers here. We said various things, but I succinctly wrote down their answers. And I'm going to name names here. Because I want you to hear what your leaders said a disciple is. Okay? So Dr. Stewart, who because he was doing doctor things, arose late. Nevertheless, I'm hitting on him first. Okay? <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, it's kind of like he's got important things to do. Okay. He, he, he came in and he said this. He said, a, a, a disciple is someone who loves God and others serving them. Succinctly, that's what he said. And then, then I recounted what, what Doug said. Doug said basically three things. He said, number one, it's you and me. That's what a disciple is to look like. Okay, and he got some help, by the way, from his wife on that. <laughs> Amen. You and me is what it's to look like. And that look like is to be like Christ. It's Christ-likeness there. Okay, he didn't say it like that. That's the way I'm saying it, okay? Christ-likeness. And finally, his third point in this was that it's recognizable. So there is a loving God and there is a loving others in service where this Christ-likeness is recognizable in you and me who are disciples. That's what they said. Pretty good, don't you think? What do you think? Pretty good? Yep. Pretty good? Okay, pretty good. So pretty good so far. Let's get to Bob, okay? And Bob said this, and it's an intentional thing that we're doing. We're We're making this, we're doing this intentionally. Now, I want you to know that that was very good input that they had, and I greatly appreciate it, but guess who did the most talking? Huh. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to distill, as per Jesus, and the impact Jesus has had on your leaders your elders, your deacons, we're going to distill what Jesus said a disciple is. And first of all, this. A disciple is someone who is connected. He's connected to God, and he's connected to other people. That's the first thing. A disciple is connected. He's connected to God and to other people. When Jesus said disciples... He was talking about a person who was connected. That's what his disciples were. As a matter of fact, there are two places where Jesus is accused, that I'm going to draw your attention to, about your disciples. And in these places, we see a distinction because these who were opposed to him were not his disciples. 
And Jesus comments on what is characteristic of their life, and then he comments on what is characteristic of the life of his disciples. So I want you to jot this down if you can. If you can't see it, then listen to it by one of the recordings that is going on here, or we'll do it again. Maybe we'll do it that way. I don't know. What, what we will do is go on here, and in Matthew chapter 15, I'm not going to have you turn there, in Matthew chapter 15, he talks about this incident, and in Mark 7, Mark 7 is much closer, and I'm going to have you turn there if you can possibly see, which is a problem right now. In Mark 7, Jesus is confronted by his opponents, and, and this is kind of what goes on. It says here, now the Pharisees gathered together, and they looked with some scribes and they came up to Jerusalem and they saw some of Jesus' disciples and, and they were eating with their hands without washing them. Now, we do a lot of training in the medical office about washing your hands. There's a reason for that. And washing your hands is a good thing, right? But as put in parentheses here in Mark 7, they were talking about washing their hands in a symbolic way, in a ceremonial way, where they go through this dipping and this washing and this thing and this place. And, and they were talking about that. And they were eating without going through that whole ceremonial thing. It's talked about there in verses 2 all the way down through verse 4. And, and he's talking about what they were doing. So why? And listen to what they asked him as they saw them. Oh boy, this is good. I got a few more things to hold here. That's good. Okay, let me get to a light. And they said to him this, and they said to him, why, verse 5, do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Because they eat with defiled hands. And what they were talking about was not that there was dirt on them. They were talking about they hadn't gone through the ceremony of washing their hands before they ate. And Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, you hypocrites, is what he said. Because it's written like this, and he quotes Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Did you get the contrast there? The contrast was, thank you very much, the contrast was that between... Those who were opposed to him and his disciples, their hearts were far from God because the ideas they came up with as what would be a good idea, this is what people ought to do, here's a teaching, this is a good idea, and they advanced that, but they didn't get it from God. They came up with their own ideas, and they even established these as traditions, and as a result, those who were following that had hearts who were far from God. On the other hand, Jesus, bringing out the directions and commandments of God, bringing out the truth that God had directed all people to be saved by faith in him, in Christ, that's eternal life, he says, he directed them to keep these commandments of God. You leave the commandments of God and look through the traditions of men. Jesus goes on and instructs his disciples in these traditions, excuse me, in these scriptures. Wow, I got a light up here now. Whew, that helps. He instructs them in this. The point that I'm making here is that connected to God and to others is what Jesus was doing. 
with his disciples. That's what he meant. A person who's connected to God and others. A person, number two, who's changing into Christ's likeness. Because in this passage, he goes on and he instructs them with one of the greatest teachings of all. It's, it goes like this. It's what comes out of the heart that defiles a man. It's not what goes into his mouth, because what goes into his mouth goes into the digestive tract and is then eliminated, he said. That doesn't taint a man. What taints a man is what comes out of the heart, he says. To eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. And he wanted them to carry that on. The point that Jesus was doing here is he was changing them to think and to act like him in that context. As a matter of fact, he makes this point really, really clear in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, when he talks about disciple. A disciple, as per Jesus, Luke chapter 6, verse 40, reads like this. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Did you advance that? Okay. Everyone who's fully trained will be like his teacher. Did you get this? Christ likeness. What a disciple as per Jesus is, is somebody who's connected to God and to others because he called all these others together and communicated this. And he was in the process of what a disciple is to him is a person who's changing into Christ likeness. That's the very definition he gives of a disciple there. He becomes like the person who's teaching him, of course, Christ being the disciple there in that context. One, one, third, one final thing. It's the third thing here. A disciple is someone who is carrying on Christ's work of service. They're carrying it on. Uh, in the passage that we started with, Matthew chapter 28, the great project, remember what he said the project is? Go do what? Make disciples. You see, disciples aren't hatched. Disciples don't materialize like with a transporter beam coming in here. And here they are. That's a Star trek -y thing. And by the way, that at this point in time is an imagination. Pure imagination. They do have some fax machines that you can now fax solid objects by, but the transporter beam is still not in existence, okay? Because it's still just a piece of plastic, not a person. Point is this. Disciples are made. And Jesus talking about what a disciple is, intended my disciples, intended what others saw as your disciples, to be making disciples. What a disciple is, is someone who's carrying on Christ's work of service in making People who are connected to God and others. People who are changing into Christ's likeness and people who are picking up and carrying on this making of disciples. Our elders and deacons were right. It is loving God and others. It is Christ's likeness. It is an intentional thing we're carrying on. It is connected to God and others. It is changing into Christ likeness. It is carrying this on. That's what a disciple is. Now, I want to add this. The second point here is seeing clearly Jesus' purpose in this. He had a purpose for them. 
The first idea is what a disciple is. The second here is what is his purpose for his disciples. And I'm going to kind of go through this kind of pretty readily. Number one, his purpose was for them to be connected to God and others. Did we hear that before? His purpose was them to be connected to God and others. Here, let me show you this taking place. And we're going to take a look to see if his purpose is achieved. I'm going to refer to this uh, because it's so dark in here. I'll refer to the passages and I'll kind of quote them as I'm going along. Okay? In Acts chapter 1... We have the immediate point in time, about 40 days in there, before Jesus left, right? What we saw in the Great Commission, the great project, was that he was just resurrected. He told them to go to Galilee. He would meet them there. He met them there. He gave them the project. Make disciples. This is what he meant. Then, during a 40-day time period, he was popping in and out and seeing people, and they were giving proofs of his resurrection all around. Boy, we could talk about that a great deal. But here in Acts chapter 1, we come to the end of this 40 days when he was doing this. And he had told them from Galilee to go to Jerusalem, and I will meet you there. I want you to tarry there. I want you to stay. I want you to hang out in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And and he tells them why. Well, the day comes around. They met him in Jerusalem. And they ask him, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom now? This is what we're anticipating. And he says, it's not for you to know the time or the place that God has established. But this is what's for you now. This is my purpose for you now. You shall receive power. When what? When what? The Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is what his purpose was. His purpose was for them to be connected to God. Holy Spirit coming in and indwelling. And for them then to connect God to other people by being the witnesses to this. Witnesses to Jesus. Witnesses to God. Witnesses to the Holy Spirit. Witnesses to telling about this. This is the plan. This is the purpose. This is what he was after. And suddenly when he was saying this, what happened? In that context, what happened? While he was saying this, what happened? (sighs) They see him ascend into heaven and he's taken out of their sight. Do you think he was emphasizing that? Do you think he was making a point there about that? When he said those things and gone. And then when the day of fairly cost fully comes, the spirit comes. And boy, is it recognizable. And what does Peter do, Acts chapter 2? He stands up and he tells them in the context of their life about how Jesus, God's work, is connected to them and he does it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Talk about connecting people to God. It was his purpose, connecting them to God. And by the way, were they together? Acts chapter 2, it says they had everything in common and they were together day after day, so he connected them to God and other people. Number two, what his purpose was, was for them to be changing. In Acts 3, very interesting events take place because in Acts 3, this stuff that they're talking about gets reacted to. Remember what happens? Peter goes by the temple and he sees a guy And he talks about Jesus and what God can do for this guy. And he's healed. Ministry to the community. And as he gets healed, then uh, there's all kinds of problems that come up with this. Because they don't want him talking in Jesus' name anymore. And so they drag Acts 4, these guys, in before the religious leaders who were his opponents, like the Democrats and Republicans. And I'm not going through that all again, okay? They were opponents, and they interview these guys, 
And the response that they gave, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says this. It says, and they marveled because these guys were uneducated. They were unlearned guys. They weren't steeped in this. But it was noticeable that they were like Jesus having been with him. That was his purpose. That was his purpose right there. Christ likeness and in Acts 4.13, they saw that. Was his purpose achieved? Purpose achieved? What do you think? Purpose achieved? Not getting much of a response. Purpose achieved. Do you have to have lights to respond? <laughs> was his purpose achieved? Yes. It was. It was definitely achieved. And then finally this. Then they were to carry on. As a matter of fact, that's what the whole book of Acts is about. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. As a matter of fact, and you get to Acts 11, 11, 26 says this. The disciples were first called Christians. And any, you know what Christians means? It, it means Christ-like ones. It means little Christ. It means Christ people. Was he achieving his purpose? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was his purpose. And you're saying, hey, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What a disciple was, as per Jesus, is exactly in line with the purpose that he achieved with them. Did you notice that? Did you notice that? Is that a forced thing? No, it's a made thing. He made disciples and achieved his purpose in them. Can I tell you this? That his purpose has not changed for the church. It is still the same. Let me put up this verse. Purpose as per Jesus. In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Did you hear that? You didn't choose me to be in on this thing. I chose you to be on this thing. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. As a matter of fact, I chose you, I appointed you, that you should go bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. What's my point here? My point here is this purpose of Jesus is achieved by him. You see, whose authority is this done by? This making disciples. It's Christ's authority given from God. And how much authority does he have? All authority. All authority where? Everywhere. Every, heaven and on earth. Now, when he talks about authority, he talks about jurisdiction or the right to do this. And number two, he talks about the power to do this. So what a disciple is, which is his purpose for his followers, and the church is achieved. Is achieved. His purpose is achieved. As a matter of fact, in the church, I put out Ephesians 4, 8 through 16 because he tells us exactly that purpose. The purpose that continues. When Christ ascended into heaven, which has happened in Acts, this is what he did. When he ascended, he gave gifts to men. And the gifts were apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, for the, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, until we all come to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, Christ's likeness. That speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him who is all things, who is the head. And the body, doing what each part of the body is supposed to do, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's his purpose. The same purpose that he had for them is what he gave for the church. It's the same purpose. Now, we've got one final thing to do today. We have seen clearly his purpose or his goal for them, which, by the way, is the goal for the church. 
We've taught about what a disciple is. If we exist to make disciples, now we know what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is connected to God and others. A disciple is someone who is changing into Christ-likeness. And a disciple is someone who is carrying on this work of making disciples. They're not hatched. They're made like you make a meal. You put your hands and thought and resources into this. We've got one final thing here, and that is to talk about the process here. The process of doing this. This is vital. This is like the whole thing. And this is something that we're going to call the heartland rhythm. Okay, you know your heart has a rhythm? You know that? Yeah, you ever, ever have a stethoscope? You know, sometimes you don't even need to have a stethoscope. If you were doing something, you just lay down and you can feel your heart, right? Sometimes when you've been up on your feet a long time, you lift up your feet and you can feel your heart and the rhythm, right? Your heart, we call it the heartbeat, right? We can, we can all do that right now. You can put your hand, correct one, not your thumb, put your finger to your uh, vein or your artery there. I'm sure Doc would say artery. It's an artery there. And you can feel this thing, which is your heart rhythm. It kind of goes like this. Boom, 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 boom. Right there? It's kind of boom, boom, boom. And sometimes it goes boom, 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 boom. And sometimes it goes boom, boom, boom. Depending on what your rhythm is. My wife used to have an arrhythmia, they called it. And her heart never had. Matter of fact, people would listen to her heart with a stethoscope. And every time when I was with her, they'd get this look on their face. <laughs> because her heart would go boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom. It, it, was, it was like that for years and years and years and years and years. Matter of fact, she felt right when it was like that. And when it got to be regular, boom, 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 boom. she didn't feel good. Isn't that strange? Then when Ellie came along, well, I'm not going through the whole story, but she got a, a rhythm that was a rhythm, not arrhythmia. There's a, there's a rhythm. Heartland has a rhythm, a heart rhythm for doing this. And this is our vision. This is our strategy. This is our goal. This is it. Now, I want you to know this isn't my design. This isn't my concoction. It comes from being based on what a disciple is as per Jesus. Someone who is connected. Someone who is changing into Christ's likeness. Someone who is carrying this on. And what his purpose was that he achieved with them. Someone who is connected to God and others. Someone who is changing into Christ's likeness. Someone who is carrying on this making disciples. Our rhythm is based on that pacemaker. If you would. It's our rhythm. What's our rhythm? Number one. Our rhythm is connecting God, or excuse me, correcting people to God and to others. How? How? We're, we're going to do that. Matter of fact, there are some changes. I'm going to put this little sign in there. There are some changes that we're going to make in our worship service to go after. As a matter of fact, those changes have already started. Because what we want to do is focus on connecting God to people by having hearts drawn near to God. How does that happen? It comes from teaching the directions and ideas of God rather than the ideas of men. That's what it comes by. And we're going to go after that. And we're going to look at connecting God Protecting people to God and to others in the worship service by having, having people more involved in worship service. Talking about their story of interacting with God on what we're working with. It's the heartland rhythm. Number two, by the way, if you want a passage from this, this is a great passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, let me get rid of that because it's saying my battery probably is getting low. There we go. 
1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 25 and 25, sorry, 25 and 26. It talks about a worship service where people fall down in their face and say, God is surely among you because of the way they're connecting to God and other people through that ministry, okay? Someone coming up and having a teaching and someone else coming up and having a comment. And they're saying God is among you. You can look at that passage. Number two, we're going to look at changing into Christ's likeness with our rhythm. This comes with divan involvement. Here's our aim. Our aim is in our worship services, connect people to God and others, and then see them grow into Christ's likeness by moving into divan involvement. You know, iron sharpens iron. Proverbs says that's the way one man sharpens an iron, or one man sharpens another. Iron sharpens iron. That's what D-bands are designed to do. So the aim is to move them thoughtfully in a process where there's flow in a household. Remember my wife talking about the flow of the household? Remember that? She had a flow. I talked about the foundation. She had a flow. The flow was important. I got in trouble because I sounded like the flow wasn't important. Believe me, the flow is important. And the flow is from people being connected to God and others in the worship service to move into D-bands where they are iron sharpening iron. And then, if you want to see that happening, 2 Corinthians 3.18, beholding the glory of the Lord, being changed by the Spirit of the Lord, that brings freedom, he says, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Then also moving them on to carrying on the work of the ministry so that they become involved in seeing people come to worship services, in seeing people come connected to Christ by their interaction with them in the worship service where they can be moved to a D-band and then moved into a place of service. So here's the expectation that as, as a participant in D-band, since we exist to make disciples, and a disciple is someone who is connected to God and others, and a disciple is someone who is changing into Christ's likeness, and a disciple is someone who is carrying on this ministry, which, by the way, we have many disciples here, the expectation, the aim of being a part of Heartland as a member, and we're going to bring this up, we're going to challenge on this membership, is that... You participate in connecting God and others, or connecting people to God and others in worship. You participate in D-band by aiding in the growth in Christ's likeness for yourself and others. And you then become a participant in service, Christ's work of service to the worship service in a D-band in touching a life to get them connected to God and others. I want to do this. I want us to start right now, this morning, right now, to connect you to a life. A life of someone who had played the heartland rhythm in his heart. The opportunity he has to serve. Doug, you ready? <laughs> I still see you, you still see me, you still see disciples. I hope you see a disciple up here. Just hold it up and be for you. Is that right? Okay, thank you. Um, what should be spiritually inherent with as a character of disciples is that you see God in every circumstance of life. And that's how I'm going to open up as I share a little bit with my life about my life about my service to you, service to the Lord as your deacon, and how he has called me through the leadership, the elders, and through you. It's been a fantastic 10 years. I think we're closing in on 10 years. And Linda and I are having fun. There are challenges. But what I want to speak to you about is three things. First, um, my being called as your deacon and how that has challenged me and stretched me, and it has. And then secondly, uh, 
the D band that I've experienced over the time that I've been with uh, the men the Lord has placed shoulder to shoulder with me and the blessings and, and uh, challenges that we have had. And then uh, thirdly, just basically the very heart of Heartland, who we really are, what we're about, what we're not, what we're not and what we are, the third thing. These are all important things to me, things that uh, have blessed me, and I believe, uh, hopefully, God, I know He has, used you to increase my faith and deepen my love for Him and for you as well. First of all, as, the calling, as to the calling of a, as, of a deacon, uh, I did that with much trepidation. It took a, just a real short response to the request when the pastor first asked me, you know, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even have to go pray about it. Because there was a rhythm in my heart for Heartland at the time, and he placed it there. So I, I said yes right away, that I would be willing to serve the Heart and family as deacon, and serve the elders as well. So it didn't take long to figure that one out. Um, I'm still stretched concerning the aspect of my experience as a deacon. Um, rubbing elbows with my guys in the D-band, uh, serving you, our church family. Um, I know there are a lot of hurt, a lot of challenges out there, and Linda and I do pray for you. And there, there are times uh, that it stretches us when we have to counsel someone who's not listening, okay? But the, the thing that uh, uh, has also stretched me is because of my background, in military and law enforcement, there was a performance-based attitude that God used the elders and the other men in that original discipleship uh, band that I thought I understood grace, but I began to realize, wow, I'm still into performance-based thinking. And God moved me out of that. Now, listen, I still struggle with it occasionally. Because, see, I, I, I want to serve him and serve you, and I have to be careful with my attitude. Am I doing this to perform, or am I doing this in grace? Uh, secondly, the challenges, the things that stretch me in the deep end. I love my, I love my men in the group. Uh, God has seasoned their hearts. Uh, we have accountability in our group. I think we did much what Christ did with the early disciples, that there are times that we laugh, sometimes we, we cry, sometimes we get a little aggravated at one of the other believers in our d band, but then God just <laughs> continues to move us through all of that. And one of the things that He places in our heart is transparency toward each other in that d band. d band is absolutely important. Because that's, real, that's where church happens. The rubbing of the elbows and then hopefully the bonding of the hearts is what we're to have as disciples. Now thirdly, talk a little bit about what Heartland is and what Heartland is not. Let's, let's start with what Heartland is not. And this is exactly what attracted Linda and myself to the Heartland family. We're not into traditions. Okay? We have moved away from the traditions of man. Now, when I first got saved, I've been in and out of a lot of churches, Pastor, and I, I've noticed in some churches, just by tradition, and it used to be used. You guys see this uh, bench up here? Yeah, I know it's a little bit dark. Some up here might describe it. What does that look like for the guys, like folks in the back? Like a pew. Well, in some churches, they used to have a deacon's bench. Okay? Now, you notice that deacon's bench is empty? Yeah, for good reason. Because we're not going to follow tradition. We're not going to follow man's tradition. We're going to follow the truths of Christ and His thinking. That's what we're going to do at Heartland. You know what else that Heartland is about? Heart talk. See, I don't think it was a coincidence that the Lord either uh, generated or coordinated or allowed to happen, but... We all came closer, closer fitting in with our elbows, came closer to the proclamation of the Word, 
and through that, a bonding of our hearts. Because that's what Heartland's about. It's the bonding of hearts. That God moves us through the process of realizing as disciples, as we as disciples, realizing that experience. And that's what Heartland's about. It's about connecting people with God, we being connected with God and connecting others uh, with God, and we out there ministering among people. It's been fun. It's still continuing to be fun. And Linda and I are enjoying every moment of this adventure, this exciting adventure of walking with Christ and having Him help us make disciples. So, heartland, heart rhythm. Let's talk about this as to vision. Vision. What's the vision? The vision is the heartland rhythm. Say this with me. Connected to, to God, to God and, others, and others, changing, changing. into Christ-likeness, Christ carrying on, carrying on. Christ's, work Christ's work of service. Let me say that again. Carrying on, Carrying on. Christ's work, Christ's work. Of, service. of service. Can you just have a rhythm to that? And it just goes on. As a matter of fact, I can't have a rhythm. I don't have a rhythm. My kids, when I used to spank them, because I had to spank them, you know. When I spanked them, they'd always comment that I had no rhythm to it. <laughs> and I didn't. I did it because I don't have a rhythm. There is a rhythm in Heartland, so I'm going to ask our musicians to creatively come up with us a rhythm for the Heartland rhythm of being connected, of being changed, of, of carrying on this work of ministry. Connected, changing, carrying on. Connected, changing, carrying on. Say that with me. Connected, changing, carrying on. Connected, changing, carrying on. But you say that, that sounds like the definition of a disciple. Amen. Well, that sounds like the purpose Jesus was going after. Amen. That sounds like what was his strategy. Amen. That's, like, that's our vision. And, and there is no place in Heartland for stagnation. Stagnation is not an option. If you want to be stagnant, then you have to realize this. You're going to have to go somewhere else. Because in Heartland, we're going to be about connecting people to God and others. We're going to be about changing into Christ's likeness ourselves and facilitating others. And we're going to be about carrying on this over and over and over and over, his work of service. So three things. Number one, both in the worship. Number two, involved in deep end. Number three, involved in some area of pure service to Christ during the week, whether to the body or in the community. And boy, do we have a vision for that. Okay? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it.